sponsoring this talk today. And for those of you who don't know, the center is an interdisciplinary research center on campus where one of our main activities is working with scholars around campus in an interdisciplinary way to run large research grants. So we um, really build on the idea that to truly do good family research requires having people from multiple disciplines all at the table talking about problems from multiple perspectives. And we've been really successful in that endeavor. So any of you who are faculty members who are interested in trying out a new research endeavor, come and join us. Um, applications are due in January, and we have a great time with a number of scholars who you can ask them about it. Um, but we're, we're really uh, proud of that activity. One of the things that comes with um, this activity is besides sitting with a bunch of scholars working all year long in a research project, is you get to invite a senior scholar um, in your area in for a two-day visit to give a public lecture, but also spends a lot of time with our scholars working on their research plans. Um, and that's who's going to be here today, <coughs> Steve Holland, who's going to be introduced by our scholar. But I'm going to introduce our scholar first. So I want to introduce uh, Dr. Kalpana Kodal, who um, is our Family Research Scholar this year. And she's an Assistant Professor in the College of Nursing. And she received her Certificate in General Medicine, her BA, and her Master's in Public Health, as well as a Master's in Sociology and Anthropology from the Institute of Medicine at the Tuhaba University in Nepal. And then she received another Master's in Primary Health Care from Flinders University in South Australia and her PhD in International Health from the University of Tokyo in Japan. So we're meeting with Kalpana this morning, and I know that she speaks five languages. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, we were all, we were all away. Um, and the fact that she can write a research grant in English, and it's not even her first language, just, I can't even write one in English, and I put my first language, so it's very impressive. Her research focuses on mental health disparities among vulnerable <coughs> immigrant populations, which is the grant that she's working on, and her earlier work focused on dietary and micronutrient levels and their associations to depression, suicide, <coughs> metabolic syndrome, and disease prog progression in people with HIV. So she's currently developing a proposal that we worked on this morning that she's been working on for months, doing a preventative intervention to reduce stress and depression in the Bhutanese population in the Springfield area. Um, so we'll be hearing more about that in the future. Thank you so much, Marie. Good afternoon, and thank you so much for being with us today in this presentation. I'm so much honored and pleased to introduce Dr. Stephen Holland. Uh, he's the professor of psychiatry at the Vardabod University, and he's also the past president of the Association for Behavioral and Cognitive Therapies, uh, the former editor of Cognitive Therapy and Research. And his research focuses on the process and treatment of depression, especially with the particular emphasis on the enduring effects of psychosocial treatments. So many different authors have recognized his scientific contribution in the mental health research. Uh, he is the recipient of awards of distinguished scientific and distinguished professional contributions to clinical psychology from the Society of Clinical Psychology of the American Psychological Association. And he has made very important contributions in every area of psychology and brain science. And with more than 250 publications, and he has already mentioned more than 20 doctoral and postdoctoral advisors in the psychology and brain science. So, in his talk today, Dr. Holland is going to present his study findings on the cognitive therapy provided together with the medications, does little to prevent the recurrence of depression. This is the talk that he's going to give us today. Welcome, Dr. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin, very much for that lovely introduction. Thank you, Marie, for the, uh, uh, setting up the program. Uh, can you all hear me okay in the back? Mine's all right. Uh, I'll start with an apology. I get a little cranked up when I start talking about things, and I'll start speaking more rapidly. And when that happens, somebody give me a high sign, slow me down as best you can. We'll, uh, I'll, I'll be controllable for about five minutes at best. Um, so I have to do it a second or third time. The second thing is, when I start speaking more rapidly, I'll start speaking more softly, but with the mic, that should be okay. And the uh, third thing is, I'm coming off a cold, and from time to time, I'm going to get winded, which would be good, because that will give you guys a chance to take a breath. When I stop taking a breath, but it, but it will happen. <coughs> um, disclosures. Uh, most of the work I do, I do in, uh, in collaboration with some really good uh, biologically oriented psychopharmacologists, 
And when we go and give presentations jointly, they will usually have two or three slides of financial disclosures about drug companies that they get money from, et cetera. And uh, in all honesty, I don't have anything to disclose, although I am open for offers for invitations. Uh, this one, uh, just if you guys are, are not familiar with, take a look at the uh, uh, October 31st article in the uh, New Yorker about the opioid epidemic. It was started uh, almost wholly by a pharmaceutical company, Purdue Pharma, which was run by a uh, group of three brothers, all psychiatrists, that understood advertising. <coughs> the same people that brought us the Valium crisis back in the 60s that uh, the Rolling Stones made famous with their song about Mother's Little Helpers. What they did was manage to get around uh, physicians' reluctance to prescribe opioids by positing that, that uh, uh, timed release opioids didn't have the same problems with addiction that they do. Uh, and they were developed a, a pretty reasonable medication uh, Oxycontin uh, for use with terminal cancer patients to help them sleep through the night. You need something to let you sleep eight to twelve hours, and they did. Uh, the problem is it's, it's highly addictive. They uh, were able to market the way that a lot of physicians, in uh, particularly the middle of the states, uh, started prescribing. And uh, then when they figured out that it was indeed everybody's addicted to any other kind of opioid, and physicians stopped prescribing, then they'd already created a market for heroin and the like. So it's it's a classic example of how uh, excuse me if you would. Uh, Pharmaceutical companies are not in business to do good, they're in business to do well. And sometimes you have to keep a weather eye on that. <coughs> um, the other thing is, I think we have until 1.15, is that correct? And uh, we certainly have time for questions at the end, but uh, I'm more than happy to entertain any questions that you guys have if there's something that's not clear. If there's something that you want to comment on, if you want to express outrage at any point in the talk, please feel free to do that. We'll have time for questions later, but don't hesitate to bring things up as we go through. I want to start out by talking about temporality and depression. I've spent the better part of my career working with depression, studying depression, uh, and uh, uh, always for whatever has been fascinated by it. I certainly, a couple of times in my early uh, adult life, could have fit in my own studies, so I've learned a little bit of the experience of. Some familiar with what the phenomenon is, but it is I was found a curious phenomenon. And the temporality works in the following way. This is one of the two, by the way, can you guys see the slides okay? Yes. Uh, this is one of the two most famous slides in the depression literature. It's the five R's uh, done by uh, David Kupfer and uh, Ellen Frank. And if you start from somebody who's non depressed and they start sliding into a depression, by the time they get fully into an episode, suppose you start them on medication treatment, uh, you're going to get them better fairly rapidly. The first R, is when they get back to what we call response. That's better but not fully well. They usually define for, for pharmaceutical trials as a 50% reduction in symptoms, and that's a good thing. By the time you get them all the way asymptomatic back to where they were before they got depressed, we're going to call that remission. So response and better but not well remission is large asymptomatic. Um, if you are not treating with medications, uh, most depressions are time limited, meaning any given episode tends to go away on its own. Not all, but most will. And this dashed line is about the time it would take for an episode of depression to clear on its own. Usually, in we're about uh, six months to a year from the time it starts. So, start here, maybe about three months of medication treatment to get them back into remission. If you weren't treating pharmacologically, it would take them about this long to get back to what we call recovery. If somebody has a return of symptoms during that interval between the time that you can get them better on medications and the time that it would take the episode to run its course, we refer to that as a relapse. It's, they're symptomatic, it's come back, but it's the same episode coming back. And again, the uh, mic is okay, you can hear me still in the back, gotcha. Um, if you, anybody that's ever had a child who's had an ear infection, you know that your child gets an ear infection, they get feverish, they get hot, they're crying, they're in pain, you take them to the pediatrician, the pediatrician starts them on an antibiotic and uh, tells you, don't stop the antibiotic as soon as the pain goes away, as soon as they're better. Keep it going uh, for about another week to 10 days, cause the infections in the system to stop it too soon, the infection reasserts itself. Reasserts itself. And that's what we think is going on with relapse. Uh, I'm on an antibiotic now for my lung infection. I'm about two or three days in. I feel better, but I don't want to stop it yet. I'm going to keep it on for about seven to ten days uh, as per instructions. Uh, about the time that you're protecting somebody six to nine months on medications, uh, it's probably relatively safe to bring them back off of that. What we call that recovery. And the assumption of recovery is the person is not only still asymptomatic, but they're past the underlying episode. So whatever the underlying pathophysiology is, has cleared by that point in time, and it's now safer to bring them off. Now, uh, anybody who has ever been depressed before is about three to five times greater risk of getting depressed again in the future than somebody who's never been depressed. And if you have another new onset of an episode, of, uh, we call that recurrence, meaning that 
It's not the old episode coming back, it's a new episode starting, but we know that the odds are about three, at least three times greater that they're going to have subsequent episodes of depression. So again, we think depression is being self-limiting and recurrent. However, that's about a third, that's, you cut the risk by about a third relative to if you stop the medication too soon. So there's, there's this curious temporality to depression that you don't find in other things. If you have a specific phobia, I'm not wild about spiders, tougher on the spiders because I'm bigger than they are, but I wasn't wild about spiders at age five, I wasn't wild about spiders at age 25, I'm not wild about spiders at uh, uh, 25 plus uh, that I have now. Uh, but I won't worry about spiders if they're not around. But if you're depressed, uh, you're depressed for a finite period of time, and you're going to be depressed at work, at home, or anywhere you go. So depression tends to be temporal in its nature, and uh, other kinds of disorders tend to be uh, uh, more situations out. The reason I point all of this out is that as good as useful as the medications are, they don't address the underlying causal drivers of the episode. They don't, they're purely palliative. They reduce the symptomatic distress without altering the underlying course of the episode. And we know that because if you take it away too soon, it pops right back. And you can keep somebody on medication uh, uh, longer and you reduce the likelihood of a new episode starting, but they don't, having been on medications, there's nothing to reduce any future risk. So they're purely palliative interventions, which, as good as useful as they are, they, they um, suppress symptoms, but they do nothing to alter the underlying course of the pathophysiology. Just said that. Uh, acute response. I get uh, particularly interested throughout my career in cognitive therapy. It's a particular version of the cognitive approach. And um, in my training back in the mid-70s, the Arab back of the help generate the approach, and subsequently I've gotten interested and involved uh, in the work of behavioral activation, Christopher Martelli in the front row has been very helpful in that process for me. But I still, uh, my primary attachment and my primary research has been with cognitive behavioral, cognitive therapy as a particular approach. Uh, the American Psychiatric Association is on record as saying that you can probably get away with doing psych psychosocial interventions like cognitive therapy or behavioral activation or interpersonal psychotherapy, which also has good outcome data, with uh, less severe depressions. But for more severe depressions, and we were only talking about MDD, which are all pretty severe, but uh, we're not talking about psychotic depressions. Non-psychotic depressions, for more severe depressions, they would say you really need to medicate if you don't have to do ECT. That's something they said in their uh, guidelines back in 2000. Uh, they repeated that in 2010, and um, I think that's really necessarily true. Uh, my colleague, Rob Moose, and I did a project back in the mid uh, aughts, I think, uh, what started it in the mid 90s where we wanted to, to take a look at only those patients who met criteria from major depression but were more severely depressed, essentially the top 50% of the MDD populations. And we took uh, 240 patients at two sites. We had Vanderbilt, my site, and Penn, where uh, Rob was, and two good psychopharm colleagues, Rick Shelton at Vanderbilt and Jay Amsterdam at, uh, at Penn, quite good uh, uh, medication researchers, who randomized those 240 patients either to cognitive therapy alone antidepressant medications were pulled to SIBO. And I should just add, by the way, when I look away, does the volume go down? Yeah. Not that time. That sounds good. So, I'll turn this way. Um, we went looking for severity. We also got chronicity and comorbidity. Uh, two thirds of our sample met criterion for one or more access one class of disorders. Half of our sample met criterion for an access two disorder. Um, about uh, a third of our sample had substance abuse problems, and some significant minority of the sample were uh, mildly hypomanic. If they were bipolar one, we would screen out, but bipolar two, we were really fuzzy on. And basically, it worked this way. They couldn't be drinking more than either of our prescribing psychiatrists, or they, and Jay's a real line of functionality, was a pretty high bar, or they couldn't be more hypomanic than any of our psychology PIs that would be in the, involved. They think that was a pretty high bar. But um, we randomized these folks to the three conditions. The cognitive therapy, they got 16 weeks of cognitive therapy, uh, up to 20 sessions cognitive therapy over 16 weeks. Uh, just as an aside, and I assume the VA probably pretty much the same thing. If you have somebody who's severely depressed, you don't want to wait to see him the next time. It's like pushing a rock up the hill at least twice a week at the beginning. Otherwise, you're, it's, it's like you're reintroducing yourself to the hippocampus each time uh, that you meet. Um, but uh, we had to max about 24 sessions over that period of time, but otherwise, straight cognitive therapy. Uh, antidepressant medications, it was paroxetine. Uh, it's a double-sized condition, I'll tell you why in a moment, but it was uh, paroxetine as the medication, and at that time, paroxetine was the SSRI with the best data uh, for working with more severely depressed patients. Um, third condition was a placebo control. Uh, what we wanted to do was to make sure that we had a sample that was pharmacologically responsive because we were really addressing this APA, American Psychiatric uh, 
due to Google APA concern that um, you couldn't, there are some patients you just couldn't do a psychosocial intervention alone without having medication. So we wanted to be sure we had those folks. We wanted to uh, be able to demonstrate that our sample was pharmacologic responsive if they were. We also wanted to be able to demonstrate that we did the pharmacotherapy well enough to get that kind of response in the, uh, in the uh, pharmaceutical literature. They call that assay sensitivity. We wanted to show that the patients were responsive to meds and that the medications work. So we wanted to make sure we could make that standard. The placebo condition we only ran for eight weeks um, because if you can't show the drug placebo heroes in that time, you're probably not going to get it. We didn't need to keep folks on placebo longer than that. At the end of the eight weeks, we broke the blind. Folks that are on placebo alone, if they still needed treatment, and most did, we then provided the additional treatment for. Uh, and the uh, folks in the medication condition, if they weren't fully uh, uh, responded, we would then go ahead and augment the lithium or dizipramine, uh, pretty aggressive pharmaco pharmacotherapy dosing and pretty aggressive uh, to have the uh, augmentation of that strategy. So we really have um, uh, pretty strong, active, adequate, more than uh, typically adequate uh, pharmacotherapy. Uh, the comparison between cognitive therapy and the two pole conditions, of course, is just single blind. The patient knew that he or she was getting cognitive therapy, the therapist knew what he or she was delivering, but the independent evaluator who did the primary outcome measure, the Hamilton rating scales of depression, didn't know. Triple blind between the two full conditions. The patient didn't know, prescribing clinician didn't know, and the independent evaluator didn't know who had active medication in the pill. This is what we basically got. At eight weeks, when we broke the blind with placebo, we basically doubled the response rate. Uh, pump is uh, good, it means we're getting a percentage of responders. Basically, doubled the response rate by using the active, medi active medication. We had a nice, strong pharmacological effect. Uh, our patients were pharmacologically responsive on average, and we did the pharmacotherapy well. Cognitive therapy, despite what the little APA would say, pretty much held its own with medication a little slower, not quite as complete a remission, uh, both better than placebo, and by the time we got 16 weeks out, you could have graphed one on top of the other. We had just under 60% response to each. Bottom line point here is that, uh, back to what the APA would have to say, despite their guidelines, if you do cognitive therapy well, it can hold its own with medication quite nicely. Later on, I'll show you a slide uh, from the Seattle trial that uh, Christopher was very much involved in, was going to be the therapist, and the same thing goes for behavioral activation. The same thing also goes for your personal psychotherapy. If you have a psych... Uh, slow it down. Thank you. <laughs> no, thank you very much. I appreciate that. Um, if, if you... If, now, all, we don't have good data on some of the other more uh, widely used psychological interventions. Maybe they work, maybe they don't for depression, but for the ones that haven't adequately tested, uh, cognitive therapy, behavioral activation, interpersonal psychotherapy, it's not true that you can't get as good a response to those interventions as you get the medication that you can. Now the question is, does it have an enduring effect? It's nice that it holds it on with medication, but we've already seen that medications, as good as they are, are purely symptom suppressive, purely palliative. They do nothing to alter the underlying course of the disorder. And the question is, does a psychosocial intervention do that? We've always thought that they might, and we're kind of curious if indeed they do. Take a breath if you guys want to do the same. <laughs> I've shown you the data from the first acute treatment phase, the first 16 weeks. Now, the placebo folks, out of the subsequent slides, they're getting humanitarian treatment. But the uh, folks with cognitive therapy who got better, we now stopped the cognitive therapy. They could have an occasional booster session. That's why the line's a little dashed. Uh, no more than one session in a month, no more than three over the course of the whole year. It's as if you send your child off to college, you don't meet them right now, his or her ruby. I hope they'll come on to vacations. Our child didn't, but uh, it was rather crazy. But you keep the door open. What we don't want to do is keep doing cognitive therapy. We do want to keep the relationship kind of in place in case they need it. And uh, only about half of our patients in the CBT cell uh, used any of the uh, uh, booster sessions. Only about a quarter used all three, so some did, some didn't. Uh, the medication condition, got better medications, we do a second randomization. We either keep them on the continuation medication, which is the current standard of treatment. No good pharmacologist would stop medication that soon after somebody gets better. If you remember our earlier five hours curve, that should be during that period of risk for relapse. Uh, but then the other uh, groups of uh, uh withdrew the medication. Um, again, triple blind, patient known, et cetera, et cetera, and switch them on the pill placebo. So they're still taking pills, still keeping up with their uh, physician, but medication and the active pharmacological agent is no longer the pill. We follow everybody through the court over the course of the year, looking particularly at relapse. At the end of that year, everything stops. We follow for another year looking for recurrence, that the onset of 40 new episodes. Now this is a survival curve. It's a little complicated, so we walk you through. 
up at the top is good. Everybody's in at least partial remission coming in. These are the folks that got better. If they didn't get better, we provide additional treatment outside of this particular slide. So those folks that did get better, uh, the yellow line are the folks that got better on medication that we then withdraw with go placebo. What you can see is most of them have a relapse. Most of the relapses happen over the first six months. We end up with 80% of the relapse before the end of the first year. Very high rate of relapse. This is a high risk population and they're very vulnerable. You get them better on medication, take the medication away, they're going to start falling apart pretty rapidly, and they did. The uh, red line are the folks that stayed on continuation medication, and we cut that uh, risk for relapse in about half. It's a good, strong pharmacological continuation effect replicated what you get in the literature. Again, it gives us assay sensitivity, not only do the drugs work, they keep on working as long as you keep providing them. But on the dash line, not everybody who's supposed to stay on medications actually does. And if somebody was non-compliant and had a relapse, we just censored that. So it's as if we said it didn't count if they, uh, if they had a relapse when they're supposed to be taking medications if they weren't at least 75% compliant. That shows you the best they could have gotten from medication and everybody done what they were asked to do. The green line should actually be a dash, dash line because those are the folks that have prior cognitive therapy but they only have medication for recession. session. Most of them didn't get that. What you can see is the folks that have prior cognitive therapy back here at this point in time, they considerably better than the folks who are no longer on medication, and if anything, physically better, but not significantly better than the folks who got uh, continuation medication. Good, strong evidence for an enduring effect for cognitive therapy. Nice thing, not only does it work in patients better, but something's going on, either they have changed in some way, or they've developed skills that's protected when gets the uh, symptoms coming back. I'm going to show you another slide in a minute, but at the end of the year, everything stops. It's a little hard to tell here, but Moving back up to the top, because these folks are all now still recovered. I'll give me another spot curve from here. Another spot curve from here. Uh, what we can see is we're still getting a difference, even a, a year after cognitive therapy is over, it's still continuing to protect folks versus the folks that were protected from medication by medication for a year and then get the medications away. It looks like. Looks like uh, looks like cognitive therapy not only uh, is as efficacious as medications in getting somebody well, it looks like it has an enduring effect that protects against relapse and possibly recurrence. Less sure because the sample is smaller. Bottom line, uh, we'll get to the bottom line. Um, Tim Kuipers, the uh, marvelous Dutch meta-analyst, has taken a look at the eight trials that have looked at data in the way I just showed you. The Holland study is the one that uh, I just showed you the data for. Across those eight trials, we're comparing prior cognitive therapy to prior medications. Uh, these are odd ratios. An odd ratio of one suggests anything uh, above one means prior cognitive therapy did better than prior medication. Below one means prior medication did better than prior cognitive therapy. And in seven out of eight trials, six of them were significant. Cognitive therapy, prior cognitive therapy uh, had lower rates of relapse than prior medication treatment. It's a pretty robust phenomenon in the, in the psychological literature. In psychotherapy literature, it's one of the most robust phenomena we have. The only one that fell with the shortest significance was the NIH Collaborative, and they got close. And the little small pilot study by Robin Jarrett with an atypical sample, five or six patients per, was the only one that went the other way, which she thinks that's more artifact. So it looks like a pretty reliable effect. If you take a look at prior cognitive therapy relative to continuation medication, again, the Holland study I already showed you the data for, smaller number of studies there, pretty much the same kind of thing. Let me back up for just a minute. The effect size here, 2.61, means we're reducing risk for relapse by more than half, but, uh, two and a half times, if you will. And uh, relative to the current standard, uh, keeping folks on medication, it's not as big a difference as 1.6, but it's still uh, nearly significant difference, just the Jarrett study, so I'm going to pull this down, and uh, we still think that's pretty close to being uh, there as well. <coughs> Bottom line is, uh, it does look like we have an enduring effect for cognitive therapy. And, uh, not only does it seem to be efficacious in getting patients better, it looks like it helps keep folks better after treatment is over, which is something that you easily can't say for the medications. Moderation. Do patient, different patients respond differently to the different treatments? Um, these are additional data from the Penn Valley study that I've already shown you. For example, if you have an access to disorder, if you meet criteria for one or more of those disorders, you did better on medications than you did on cognitive therapy. If you didn't, you did better on cognitive therapy than you did on medications. It looks like, wherever you walk in the... 
Yeah. 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 Whether you walk in the door with an access to disorder or not predicts which treatment you're going to do better on. That's what we mean by moderation. Differential response for different people across the different treatments. Now, we were a little surprised. I want to see this replicate. A little surprised, and because uh, we didn't predict that coming in. If anything, but maybe CBT would be a little better for the more complicated access to patients. And our psychiatric colleague, Jen, Jay Amsterdam, said, no, no, of course, that's what you would have expected. He said, Jay, you didn't expect that for us when you were in the that would help. And so we'll think about it. If you look at the animal literature, what does the SSRIs do? They reduce stress reactivity, and they reduce impulsivity. And what do access, people with access to disorders do? They act out under stress. So if we can slip a little bit of porosity into the White House water supply, maybe that would help with the tweets in the morning. Yes? Can you tell me what an access to disorder well, I'm sorry, yeah. Uh, that's personality disorder. Okay. Those are folks who, uh, three major clusters, people that have uh, personality disorders that look a little like the schizophrenia without being psychotic, a schizoid personality, paranoid personality, et cetera. Access uh, cluster B are the folks that act out under stress, people with narcissism, people with antisocial personality, people with borderline personality, and access to the ones that look like the uh, neurotic disorders, avoidant, uh, uh, passive, uh, aggressive. And, and especially the access to folks, uh, the cluster B folks, the people that acted out in distress in dramatic ways were the ones who showed us the biggest effects. And again, think about it. You know, these, are, these are people that get in trouble with other people because they do dumb things when they get stressed. And uh, we got a nice effect of the medications there. Differential effect. <coughs> there are a couple of others. I just want to show you one more. If you had the, the number of prior exposures to medication, predicted negatively how you're going to do a medication on our travel. The more previous medications you've done, the less one we did. Uh, for cognitive therapy, it didn't make any difference. Again, our colleague Jay Amsterdam, who's very interested in what he calls progressive resistance, points out that with SSRIs, we have this thing that we call Paxil Pupat. We even call uh, uh, progressive resistance what we have a name for, tachyphylaxis. And uh, you don't bother naming something in the pharmacological literature unless there's some reason to think that it does. And people seem to, uh, not everybody, but about one person in five, to be running along stable with a nice pharmacological effect in medications, and they lose it. We didn't used to talk about a group of but we do talk about SSRI Pupat. And it looks like maybe there's something about the serotonin system that facilitates that. Uh, Jay is convinced that uh, the more exposures you get, the more your brain gets turned off to response to the medications. There's another equally plausible interpretation, which is just that if you get somebody who's not going to respond to anyone, you chase them with more medications. So it could be individual differences. People uh, who are less likely to respond in the first place are going to get prescribed more medications and hope to find something to work with them. Or it could be something where any given individual put on these medications changes over time. We don't know the answer, but we can think of ways to begin to answer that. <coughs> I point these out only because you can take personality disorder, you can take prior medication history. I didn't show you a couple of slides. But my colleague, Rob DeRoops at Penn, his work was something he now calls the Personalized Advantage Index. Essentially, it's treatment selection algorithms. He can take information prior to treatment, identify using machine learning who it is that's most likely to respond to different interventions. And when you do that, you might be able to improve the overall efficacy, the efficiency of your, of your treatment systems just by getting the right treatment to a given person. It's the kind of thing we dreamed about uh, for years. Uh, it's, it's the old Gordon Paul dictum of finding the right treatment for a given individual at the right time. We now have technology. <clears throat> so we have technologies that begin to help us begin to actually do that. And uh, when Rob applied his approaches to the uh, Penn Gandy data, uh, what you find is that uh, some folks, it doesn't seem to make much difference what they're going to get the majority, but for a uh, uh, number of folks, the small, smaller numbers show a bigger differential response. And if you were to go back and separate those folks who got what they should have gotten according to the PAI versus those folks who didn't, you look over here on the right, what you get is a difference which is about three and a half points on the Hamilton, which is bigger than our drug placebo difference. If Rob is right, if we apply these technologies, we ought to be able to identify who's going to respond best to what in a way that's at least as efficacious as any of the specific effects we get from medications or psychotherapies. If so, that's going to be the hottest thing since sliced bread. And I'll show you later on the uh, design for study we want to use to begin to try to test that. Uh, bottom line is, yeah, it does look like you select a uh, the different people respond to different things. It's not just that it's cognitive therapy, uberales, or medications, uberales. Different folks respond to different things. Not everybody, but about half of our sample did, about a quarter each for CBT versus medications. The other half, probably more non specific response, uh, but if so, that means you can respond to either respond or not respond to virtually anything. It's, it's I think, a uh, quasi wave of the future. <coughs> Next question mediation. If moderation is uh, 
Do you give, give respond to different things? Mediation is how is it that somebody responds when they do respond? What are the mechanisms that really drive that? And we want to take a look at that. I don't want to spend too much of time on that uh, today and in here. I just give an overall summary slide. This courtesy of Helen Mayberg, who the uh, uh, neurologist who's done some marvelous work, uh, was started in Toronto, now done at Emory. And over a series of studies, listen to here, <coughs> Helen will image patients pre and post treatment, some treated with cognitive therapy, some treated with medications. And to summarize across the trials, you get a lot of changes in the brain across time. Some of them are non specific. Maybe uh, there are uh, uh, consequences of, of somebody getting better, but there's some things which change differentially with the different treatments. And the things that change differentially in cognitive therapy are more cortically mediated. They're the higher order thinking processes. And the things that change differentially in medication treatment are more limbic system and brainstem, they're the lower or older things. And it makes great good sense because what we think has always traditionally driven emotional response. Um, an organism has to be able to get scared, angry, sad if it doesn't want to be somebody else's lunch earlier in the, uh, in the evolutionary prospect when they have to develop a cortex to override emotions. And anybody that's ever watched a uh, young child grow up knows that you have affect. Better? Yeah. You have an affective response before you have the capacity to inhibit that affective response. And it, what we're getting, what she's getting in her uh, differential changes in the brain is wholly consistent with that. We don't know for sure, but the bottom line, the guess here, is that cognitive therapy, when it works, medications, when they work, work more on the brain stem, the limbic system, basically to dampen down the stress response. And cognitive therapy, when it works, is involved in more cortical activation, which allows uh, regulation of emotional systems. And it's more cortically driven. Steve Mayer. Steve Mayer was one of the two original learned helplessness people. Uh, Marty Sullivan and Steve Mayer. Marty Sullivan got famous doing it. Steve Mayer went back into basic neuroscience, was uh, uh, not shy of retiring. He actually is as good an imitation of Larry David. Larry David does a good imitation of him. But he's very he's kind of crusty and uh, uh, more basic researcher. Uh, this is the basic helplessness triad design. The animal on the right doesn't get stressed. It's put in the, bo the box. The uh, electrode is not connected to the tail, so nothing bad happens to it other than the hand to get to the box. The animal in the left is hooked up to the tail shock. It gets shocked unpredictably. Rats don't like shock. Uh, it's got okay. It's got a um, wheel that can turn. It turns the wheel. It turns the shock off. The animal in the middle gets shocked exactly the same time as the animal on the left. The animal on the left turns it off. It goes off the animal in the middle. The only difference is psychological. They both get shocked exactly the same time, exactly the same schedule. The animal on the left can control it. The animal in the middle can't. That's the learned helpless phenomenon. It's the animal in the middle that shows behavioral disruption that looks like depression. Uh, they'll lay on the floor of the cage. They don't explore new environments. They have uh, more difficulty learning to escape avoidance responses. If we were so confident in that, we use it as a screen for new pharmacological agents, as a test for things which might be helpful in treating depression. Uh, but we've always ignored for the last three decades the animal on the left. It turns out the animals on the left do better than the control animals when you put them in new situations. And that's what bears is. Uh, and a classic series of articles over the last decade has uh, mapped out the uh, underlying uh, neurophysiology behind that, but he calls that learned resilience. It's not just that uh, it's good not to be stressed, it's actually good to be stressed if you can handle the stressors. It makes you stronger, it makes you more confident, it makes you better able to handle new things. And he's mapped out the neural basis for that. Uh, the dorsal raphae nucleus, the body of, uh, these are the cell bodies uh, in the brain stem where all the cells in the brain that use serotonin as a neurotransmitter. Serotonin is the uh, neurotransmitter that's most affected by uh, serotonergic agents, SSRIs, probably involved in most of the um, antidepressant responses. When you get stressed, the dorsal raphae nucleus fires, serotonergic neurons project to the limbic system, to the amygdala, to the hippocampus, to the cortex as well, and it essentially turns on the stress response. If you're going to get stressed by something, it's going to fire. Um, the ventral the medial prefrontal cortex is the region of the brain that lights up in those animals in the far left. This lights up in the animals in the middle box. This lights up in the animals in the far left. It has a descending pathway, uh, glutamatergic, which synapses on the GABA. GABA is inhibitory in the dorsal raphe. The GABA turns off the stress response. In essence, when you have psychological control and you know it, who knows exactly what the rats know, but they get psychological control, they act as if they know it, 
uh, the cortex overrides the stress response. It's as if the cortex is telling the limbic system, don't worry about this, I got it handled. Okay? Lovely. He's up. If, uh, uh, Stephen, the studies, if he blocks the firing of the, uh, of the, uh, of the projection down, sending pathway from the ventral medial preformed cortex, if he blocks that, he can make resilient rats act as if they're helpless. He can override the training that they got. And, oops, went too far. If he makes it fire, he can make the helpless rats act like they're resilient. He's still he, he loves what he's done because he thinks as a, as a uh, neuroscientist, he's shown the wiring diagrams. Who cares about the learning conditions? He can show exactly how the brain is wired up, and you can trick the brain into, into, the animal, into doing things differently than it was trained to do just by making the different neurons fire. Great thing for neuroscientists. Our 30-year-old uh, son, by the way, is studying neuroscience. He's in uh, La Jolla on a postdoc, and uh, what he would say he's doing these would be what uh, my wife is also a behavioral scientist and I do is he's doing real science. So there's a, <laughs> so you, you watch the progression across the, uh, the generations. Um, I have great empathy for the elders in the Bootleys population that we were talking about this morning where they're uh, no longer sure what their role is in society and the young kids are the ones that are, that are moving on. The nice thing for us and for this talk is that um, learned resilience uh, has a time course. It endures. So you can expose an animal to controllable stressors, and a week later, he's now pushed up to a month later, which in a rat is a long time, he still shows the same effect. You don't forget that kind of stuff. It looks like what we're getting for our cognitive behavioral interventions in humans. And we think maybe this is a model for how it is that cognitive therapy and behavioral activation look like they have their enduring effects. The problem with that is it also looks like if you do it, or at least the potential problem with that is if you do that in animals that are already medicated, they don't get a chance to pair the uh, experience of control with the beginning of the stress response, and the brain to form a synapse, you need to two things to happen simultaneously. And you've got medications dampening down the stress response, you just might not learn that you have control in a way that helps you the next time you don't have control. That brings us to the question, does combining uh, treatment with medications undercut the enduring effects of CBT? And if so, is it for psychological and biological reasons? The last study, most recent study that we did, uh, Rob and myself and our, our colleagues, uh, Amsterdam and Shelton, uh, we had the two sites, Ted and Bandig, and had the third site, Rush Medical Center in Chicago. Uh, everybody got medicated in both conditions, and for half the patients, uh, we also gave them cognitive therapy on top of that. And as opposed to the typical study where we treat for a fixed period of time and see a portion of folks got better, like the earlier study I showed you, here we treated for as long as it took to get the third people first into remission. They were no longer symptom. Uh, we had pretty stiff definition. They had the asymptomatic for a month, uh, four weeks, which is about the longest in the, in the literature. And once they were in remission, we kept them going in treatment until they met criterion for recovery, which means six months without a relapse. If they did relapse during that time, we got them back in remission again and kept them going. We had an ongoing uh, struggle with our IRB and, uh, and DSMB. We wanted to go as long as we had to go. They gave us up to three years. We kind of fudged a little bit and bought an extra six months just by saving so much in remission uh, when they get this far in. Uh, uh, we're not going to stop and we're going to let the clock run for another six months to see if they either have a relapse or get back in. So we had up to 42 months. At the time somebody's fully in recovery, we then do a second randomization. We fade the cognitive therapy out with those folks that had it, and half them stay on maintenance medication for the next three years, half come off. If the medication's lung condition, half stay on maintenance medication for the next three years, half come off. We're just curious about whether or not um, we can really listen during. We're curious about whether or not this enduring effect extends to recurrence. We have some hints that might, those are pretty small samples in that second year of those projects, some hints that they might, but we're not quite sure to convince of that yet. So this is what we uh, tried to set up. The, I'll just pop because we really work into any given medication needs to be. But the uh, acute continuation phase, this is how many of these folks can we get into recovery? We have a small, modest, about 10% advantage. It comes up to more than 42. They first had to uh, uh, meet criterion for remission, which was a month, and they had to meet criterion for recovery, which was another six months. So nobody could hit recovery until seven months in. That's why the lines start going up then. And across the whole sample, 450 patients in three sites, we got a nice, polite, 10% differential. It's the kind of thing that uh, it's like a uh, no offense to anybody, like sister. It's a kiss your sister effect. It's significant finding, but a big sample, not that big a deal. Um, being from Tennessee that has a lecture significance. 
But uh, it turns out it was heavily moderated. And I won't walk through all the differences there, but uh, it, only applied, it only applied to those folks who were both severe and not chronic. And uh, I'll just show you the, uh, among the high severity patients, if you're a high severity and chronic, it wiped out the effect. I'm not going to bother showing the low severity. If you're low, lower severity, you didn't need to have the cognitive therapy for the medications. If you were high severe, it made a difference whether you were chronic or not. And if you're high severity and chronic, it didn't help. If you were high severe and not chronic, it made a huge difference, about a 30% difference. Now we're getting a big effect in the third of our sample. Again, moderation, moderation, moderation. That modest 10% increment was wholly restricted to the third of the sample who were uh, more severely depressed but not chronic in their depressions. If you look at the numbers needed to treat, nice index. It tells you how many additional patients do I need to treat to get that particular advantage. Uh, in terms of uh, the full sample, and to treat almost 10 additional patients to have con the combined treatment beat the medications alone. If we looked at either the uh, non-chronic set of the sample uh, or the folks who were uh, more severe, get it down to under six. If we look at the folks who are not chronic and more severe, we're about three and a half. That's a big effect. It's a big effect for a third of our sample. For the other two thirds, it didn't matter, but for that third of the sample, now, I did that all as a prologue. What I really want to show you are the recurrence data. We now have folks all in recovery, this, that 10% differential I showed you. Now we're, uh, we're either keeping the medication going or taking it away. The blue lines are the folks who got combined treatment. The red lines are the folks who got medication only. The solid lines are the folks that keep maintenance medication. The dashed lines are the people who are taking the medication away. And what you see is we have a lot of recurrence anyway over the course of the three years. We would have expected the dashed blue line, people that got better on combined treatment, to look like as to do as well as the folks that stayed on active medication and they did not they didn't know better than the folks that had medication alone essentially in this study uh getting cognitive therapy in combination with medication wiped out anything that looked like an enduring effect despite the fact that seven of the eight studies where you get cognitive therapy alone in the absence of medication get an enduring effect here we're doing it with medication we're not getting an enduring effect that got us worried got us a little bit nervous dave barlow did a lovely study of disorder patients Better? Good. Cognitive therapy alone or nipramine alone. Uh, they had about comparable outcome results. Now we're looking at the relapse data. If you got better on cognitive therapy alone, under 20% relapse once you took the treatments away, got better on medications, twice as likely to relapse over time. Folks got cognitive therapy combined with medication and gave you over twice the likely to relapse. You look like the data I just showed you. And if you got cognitive therapy combined with pill placebo, where you think you're on medication, but you're really not, you do as opposed to get cognitive therapy alone. Bottom line here is it looks like they're getting something like we thought we just got in our last trial. If you combine uh, treatment with an enduring effect with medication, you wipe out the enduring effect, but only if it's the active medication, not if it's just the psychological belief that you're on medication. It looks like whatever's going on is uh, may hold across other disorders, and it's pharmacologically mediated, not psychologically mediated. I just said that, but basically that. There's another study just out of Norway, Nordahl, the first author, uh, in social anxiety, which shows something very similar. Uh, only three trials uh, in the literature yet, but now have become concerned that combined treatment, which a lot of people would go to for more severe, more chronic, more comorbid patients, uh, might be fine getting them asymptomatic. If you've got to get somebody better to keep them better, but if you've got an option, you may want to not get there unless you have to because it may undercut the enduring effect. We don't know for sure, but we do not have it tested. I would simply take the sample, uh, randomized. I'd take a sample, randomized to you. Stops, let me know. Okay. Or should I just project? Yeah. Can you guys hear me? Good. Okay. Um, we don't have to test it. Again, what we didn't have in our last trial I showed you is a CBT alone condition. We'd simply do that, treat to remission, take the treatments away, and a CBT, uh, prior medication interferes with CBT. This group should do no better than that and less well than this group. So we can test that study and the study we want to do to, to take a look at that. Whitaker's book, if you 
you haven't read it, is truly um, scares you. It's the scariest thing I've read in the summer reading since Jaws. Um, <laughs> Robert Whitaker is a uh, uh, investigative journalist, so you have to take what he does with a bit of a grain of salt. His job is to sell books and get into this general controversy. However, he points out that there are a lot of things we would expect would have happened over the 50 years if we've had psychotropic, psychoactive medications, and they haven't happened. And basically, they work as follows. You would expect uh, to reduce the amount of disability, psychiatric disability. We've actually had an explosion in rates. Now, that could be for other reasons. It could be that we're just becoming more liberal and we put on wealth on disability. Uh, so this an alternate explanation. We would expect unmedication patient, unmedicated patients to do better. They don't. However, because these aren't based on randomized trials, it could just be that folks who have more severe disorders are more likely to get medicated. It could be individual differences masquerading as a treatment effect. You would expect prognoses to get better if anything they've gotten worse, but it could just be that we've gotten better at tracking patients after treatment. So we might be just more sensitive to bad things that are happening. You would expect medication, you would expect medication to make the course better, but if anything, the course of things like depression, anxiety, schizophrenia has worsened over the, the decades. Uh, but it could just be that medication withdrawal unmasks the disorder that would have been there anyway. And uh, you would not have expected a new disorder to show up. Uh, we never talked about pediatric bipolar disorder until about the last 20, 25 years, until we started putting pre-adolescent children on antidepressants. And it could just be that they've been there all along, we're just missing them, calling them something else. Uh, but you look at the couple of things that Whitaker brings up, he's got one parsimonious explanation, which is medications suppress symptoms at the expense of worsening the course of the underlying disorder, versus an alternative, all of which have multiple uh, explanations, but they require multiple explanations. And in the history of science, non-parsimonious ex explanations don't do well. Stretch your question. Uh -huh. Stretch, gotcha. The, uh, <clears throat> In the last decade or uh, last five years, so I've fallen in with an evolutionary biologist, a master fellow by the name of Paul Andrews. And what Andrews points out is that depression is an unusual disease. Most diseases either kill you in the first year of life or kill you once you get up over 60. How are you defining elderly? <laughs> yeah, whatever. Uh, when you get older. Uh, and in the intervening years, the incidence is usually low. But depression has its peak onset and incidence during the early to late to adolescence period of time, the time when people in evolutionary history are establishing their families and their careers. Most diseases don't work that way. Things that do work that way are what you would call evolved adaptation. They're things that serve a purpose that evolved in our evolutionary history. And his sense is what the purpose that depression serves is it gets you focused on the complex interpersonal social problems that would make your life difficult so if you stay focused on those long enough to solve the problem. And he points out that, for example, the dorsal raphia nucleus, the thing that uses serotonin as a transmitter, when it fires, projects the amygdala, it keeps you focused on whatever the problem is that's causing the pain. It's like you've got a splinter in your paw, it keeps you focused on the splinter, not running. Uh, the hippocampus, which allocates working memory to the problem, it makes you, it leads you to uh, ruminate and be hard to distract. It also reduces the enough signal, you're not generating new sy synapses. It projects the lateral prefrontal cortex, makes you resistant to distraction, keeps you focused on the existing problem. It projects the nucleus accumbens, it shuts down other hedonic pursuits. You don't generate new relationships, you don't go out and play tennis, do other kinds of things. You, you stew in your misery until he would say you work it out. And it projects the hypothalamus, it uh, inhibits growth, reproduction, physical activity. All he says in the service of working out the existing problem. He's got some data that suggests that maybe that actually happens spontaneously. Um, this is the other most famous, uh, the two most famous slides. This is the NMH neuron. And there's no neuron in the brain that uses both serotonin and norepinephrine as a neurotransmitter, but for the sake of the, of the uh, slide, we'll put the two together because they both work in the same kind of way. Uh, antidepressants either serve to block the degradation of the uh, neurotransmitter in the presynaptic neuron, the MAO, MAOIs block monamine oxidase, which breaks it down, or they come up the uh, transporters, which bring it back out of the synapse. The bottom line with either of those two kind of medications, they keep more neurotransmitter floating around in the synapse. And the way we understand the way things like SSRIs work is they increase transmission through the serotonergic system uh, or, and or they correct for a functional deficit in serotonin. So essentially they keep more stuff in this extracellular space in the synapse. The problem with that is we know from our genetic studies, people like Mafia and Caspit, that if you have people with either short or long alleles, so people either have a short allele in the serotonin transporter gene or a long allele, and short alleles mean you have fewer serotonin transporters. Long alleles mean you have more. Those people who have the fewest serotonin transporter genes just by bad luck of the uh, genetic draw are the ones who are most susceptible to becoming depressed under stress. 
Uh, just having bad genes doesn't get you depressed. Just having stress doesn't get you depressed. But bad genes in, uh, in the context of symptom stress doesn't get you depressed. And so what we have is a mechanism that we have well laid. Yes? Just a quick question. So if the short serotonin allele leads to decreased serotonin transmission, does that mean if you just give them more serotonin, it's still going to be saturated at that level? What that probably means is we have two mechanisms which work in the exact opposite direction. And uh, it should work. So uh, something that, uh, the, the way we think we understand the way uh, uh, antidepressants, particularly SSRIs work, is they increase the amount of serotonin in the, in the uh, synapse. And here, we have reason to think that people that have more natural, have more natural at greater risk. So that um, maybe it saturates, maybe it doesn't. Let me show you one more slide and see if this gets close to the question. But uh, two things, oh, not, uh, mechanisms should be dumb. And if you push something, it should fall over. In this case, you push something, it falls up. And uh, it, it shouldn't work that way. What uh, Andrews has laid out, people who are, uh, and let's see if this gets back to the specific question, people who are not depressed will have a certain amount of serotonin in the system on average. If you're depressed, you've got more. Now, you put an SSRI on board, it comes up with serotonin transporter gene, and the short-term effect is having even more there, it moves even further from normalcy. The more gets in there. And these levels become absolutely heroic, any, much greater than anything we have in, find in nature. But that only works about the first week to 10 days afterwards, the presynaptic neuron shuts down synthesis of serotonin, reduces the amount produced, and the postsynaptic neuron uh, has uh, atomically activated uh, postsynaptic receptors that turn down the sensitivity. So the overall effect is to reduce transmission to the serotonergic system, which brings us back to what we're saying. Uh, basically, what Andrews would say is that SSRIs work for exactly the opposite reason that modern psychiatry thinks they work. They don't work by enhancing the amount of serotonin in the transfer, they work by turning it down. It's like holding up a match to a thermostat to turn the temperature down. You're tricking the system into doing that. Now that's fine, except uh, he also says that he would predict from an evolutionary perspective, you get something he would call oppositional perturbation. What you're doing is, is uh, tricking, uh, uh, if you're interfering with the natural homeostatic mechanisms which like to bring about spontaneous transmission in the first place, something we earlier saw, it's like pushing a, compressing a spring when you let the spring up, it should spring back. The greater theory. And he's gone and looked at the data. Look at people that are on placebo. There are about one chance in five they're going to relapse once you take the placebo away. SSRIs, you double the odds because they're about 45, 40%. SNRIs, a little higher still. Tricyclic, sturdier drugs, you get both serotonin and norepinephrine, higher still. Fluoxetine, which is an SSRI, but it's an unusual SSRI, which has neuroangiogenergic effects at higher dosage levels, so it gets even more neurotransmitter systems even higher, and the medications you're most likely to relapse on after you uh, uh, get well, if you take them away, or MDLIs, which hit all three major neurotransmitter systems, serotonin, norepinephrine, and dopamine. Uh, essentially, the existing clinical data are exactly consistent with this prediction coming out of evolutionary psychology. Skip that. Bottom line here is we don't know for sure, but there are suggestions that what we might be doing is using medications that produce relief from distress in a way that prolongs the underlying episode, gets in the way of it, uh, countervenes the existing homeostatic mechanisms, and leaves you at higher risk for relapse. You never cycle out of that risk for relapse. You're always at that three times higher risk at any point that you try to come off medications, and that would be wholly consistent with what we've been finding. In the states, uh, most good psychopharmacologists will no longer talk with a patient with a history of chronic or recurrent depression about ever stopping medications. They get them on, they get them stabilized, and they're to assume that they're going to for the rest of their life. It's like we never treat diabetes. Um, so there's a question there. The study we'd like to do, and uh, I was just in Toronto last weekend, and we're working with uh, Andrews, uh, Daisy Single, of the lady I introduced you to, is uh, a good uh, global mental health researcher. Uh, ben Wong of the head of psychiatry, their first rate psychopharmacologist. What we want to do is uh, assign people uh, to a medication condition cognitive therapy condition, and then don't placebo condition. We want to blanken the gun. We want something on which people will get better, but not through any specific mechanism, one that either it reduces risk or increases risk, and we think the medications might. We treat them first to remission, then to uh, recovery. And by the way, you might well think that placebo is a pretty ineffective medication for half to maybe two-thirds of the folks with major depression. They don't get a true drug effect. They get a, it's likely to get more on placebo than our medication for majority of folks get better on antidepressant medication they're responding to the psychological belief that they're on medications, not the actual medication in the system. For those folks who are more severely depressed, you do start getting a difference there, but it's about half of them uh, show the difference. We ought to be able to get at least 75% of the folks 
uh, better on placebo that we get well with medication, etc. We treat them all the way to recovery, and then we take the, med the, uh, the treatments away. If cognitive therapy truly has an enduring effect, which I'm not sure now that it necessarily has to have, because all of our comparisons came against prior medications, and maybe it's not that cognitive therapy is good, maybe it's that medications are bad. If it truly has an enduring effect, these folks should be less likely to have recurrences than these folks who have better on placebo if there's an active specific mechanism. If medications are truly atrogenic, these folks should do worse than folks who have better on placebo. We know how to test that, and that's the study we want to put in to try to test. Um, let me see. Basically, it looks like cognitive therapy can do as well as medications, uh, even among more severely depressed patients, but it has, we think, an enduring effect. We're not even to question that. It looks like you uh, get differential moderation. It looks like you maybe work through different mechanisms. It looks like maybe CBD has a CBD is a very effect. It might get wiped out if you, have, if you combine it with medication. And there are reasons to think that medications, as useful as they are, maybe they're like remedies. You know, if you get on a, if you got a cold, you can take an over-the-counter cold remedy. It will help you feel better. It will stop the sniffles. It will relieve some of the symptoms. The problem with that is fevers are evolved in medications. So the way our body has uh, evolved prior to the introduction of antibiotics to fight off infectious agents. And if you take a cold remedy, you will feel better sooner, but you cold air longer. And we think maybe the same thing's happening with, uh, with depression. Now, I'm going to stop in a minute and ask you another question you have, and then time to minute, I'm going to go and show you a couple of slides about behavioral activation and uh, doing work in third world countries. Let me stop first. Any thoughts or questions you guys want to raise? Yeah. Hi. Thank you so much. Great presentation. Are there any other therapies that have been tried besides behavioral therapy? With, for depression. With, for depression, sure. Um, I think three, when I, I used the term cognitive behavior therapy is kind of generic. Uh, essentially, cognitive therapy is a kind of cognitive behavioral therapy which holds up really well. Stuff I've shown you so far has been pure to that. Behavioral activation, uh, uh, Professor Martello in the front row was actually good at both of them, but prefers BA at this point in time. Yeah, basically they converted uh, BA in the studies that's been done as well, and maybe has, it looks to be as efficacious as medication and as enduring as cognitive therapy. Can you say more than that? Oh, yeah, sorry, the heel okay. And um, it's, uh, it's getting a person moving, getting them rolling, and it's really bringing in a more contextual analysis. We've had behavior therapy around for, 20, for close to 50 years, but it never worked as well until you stopped and did an actual contextual analysis because not everybody gets better likes the same thing. Uh, if you want to uh, boost my mood, let me go to a movie. You know, drive my wife bananas, maybe go sit to a movie, but she's not working, it does. We got done with the first. Uh, the Lord of the Rings, and her response was, this is three hours of my life, I'll never get back. So I mean, <laughs> not that being three, did I do close, close to what you did there? And the other thing they really target very nicely is avoidance behaviors. A lot of times, we'll start avoiding things to which will lead us to reinforce it because we're nervous about it. What we have to do to get through it. So BA is a very nice intervention, has a lot going for it, and it may be easier to learn how to do than CPT, but it has very good outcome data. It's not been around as long in the right version of it. Uh, so we don't have as so much good outcome data, but the outcome data so far is quite strong. And interpersonal psychotherapy, which is um, uh, essentially focused on the uh, quality of relationships, etc., uh, also has very good outcome data. We don't know that it has some enduring effect. It's never really been adequately tested, but uh, it does have good acute response. Okay. Those are kind of the big three, and others may or may not work, but these are not good studies for them. So you know the slide where you show the stressor and the short allele, long allele, so yeah. stress interacting with the genes. Yes related to worse outcomes or better outcomes. What about resilience interacting with genes? So is there a way that CBT or any of these therapies work for some but not for others as a function of, sort of who they well, are? Yeah. Well, I don't know if you can hear what about resilience with the underlying genetics. <coughs> oh, we don't know yet. Um, but there are some things, with, there are some genes which do, again, seem to predict for resilience. And a uh, project that, uh, uh, going to try to do in Go with Victor Patel. I'll show you a slide in a minute or two about that. We've hooked up with folks at uh, Dahlia Ely and uh, at Jerome Green at the Institute of uh, Psychiatry in London uh, in the past trying to look at genetics in the context of treatment trials the kiss of death. As you get geneticists on the review committee, they didn't like the small samples we had. But, uh, and you'd have uh, uh, Tungbaka people, they didn't like the genetics of it. Turns out if you get your uh, polygenic risk scores from these very large uh, genome-wide association studies, maybe uh, 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 hundreds of thousands of, of uh, people looked in there. You can get a good stable polygenic risk score. We can use that to predict outcomes in these studies. So we think we're going to have a chance to take a look. And we want to look at exactly those kinds of questions. So far, we don't know, but they're, they're very reasonable things to look at. Anything else? Yeah? I'm just curious if 
uh, you looked at the executive function abilities of the patients as an additional moderator since you need good executive functions to interact with these therapies and executive function is only with the yeah. cortex which tells the yeah, yeah, it's a great question. We haven't because I don't know that much about those kinds of things, but we are in the study we want to do. And Pat Berry, a very good uh, uh, general psychologist out at uh, Mount University of Washington, Seattle, uh, in her samples with older adults, um, has looked very specifically. It turns out to be a very powerful model there in terms of not so much going to be better in a psychosocial intervention versus a pharmacological one. And it's, uh, we think people like me have missed that over It's a great thing to pursue. surgeries in the last five, ten years where they put you on oxycontin coming out of that, uh, it's very hard to stop even after a couple of days. And um, I can imagine it's a real scourge. Uh, we talk about it's, having, it's hijacking the, the uh, nervous system. And I would like the antidepressants a lot more than other medications, despite what I can do in the talks. Uh, much better than the minor tranquilizer and a whole lot better than the opioids. And if you can get a good effect out of the uh, of an SSRI, uh, it helps somebody get through that tough transition more power to it. Uh, at the same time, uh, working with this uh, new, pop new population, the psychiatrists involved in working the first thing to do is take people off the SSRIs because they say that it produces a different kind of problems. So I'm not an expert in this area, but the folks I know who are would be a little nervous about that. But I, I can point you to some of the uh, articles they've been in that concern. Anything else before I go on? Good. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. Can you just give us like, a quick outline of what those sessions of cognitive behavioral therapy are like? Is it just a one on one talk? Is it what kinds of questions yeah. are asked? It, it's typically done in an individual context, but it can be done in groups, and it seems to work just as well in groups. Uh, if you're doing cognitive therapy, uh, you're going to start doing more behavioral stuff in the beginning anyway, and uh, uh, you seem to be teaching patients things like take a big task, break it into its smaller steps, uh, uh, plot out, schedule things that you used to do for enjoyment, whether you feel like doing it or not, don't wait to feel like doing something, just do it and the motivation will follow. Same thing Christopher would do with behavioral activation. Uh, you'll then go on, if you do cognitive therapy, to having people test, uh, use the behavioral changes to test the accuracy of their beliefs. For example, uh, I used to like parties. My friend's going to have a party this week, and I don't think I'm going to go because I don't think I'll enjoy it. Well, let's find out whether you enjoy it or not. Let's get you there and then see. And uh, let's run the experiment test. And uh, it's basically what it is. And you can get more elaborate about that. But it's, uh, uh, it's, it's essentially uh, letting your own experiences determine what actually works for Anything else before? Yes, Oh, okay. Thank you, Christopher. Um, this study, uh, Dimension uh, 2006, first really major trial of behavioral activation. Here we got the whole range of MDD severity less severe patients, more severe patients. Less severe didn't matter what you did, whether it was cognitive therapy or behavioral activation. Christopher is one of the therapists in this trial, the supervisor for the VA condition. Uh, antidepressant medications, uh, again, paroxetine, I believe, and then pill placebo. Uh, the half of the sample that were less severely depressed did as well on placebo as they did on medications or VA or, or CT. If you're more severely depressed, you'd be better if you got medications or behavioral activation, less, uh, well, if you've got pill placebo or cognitive therapy, it really held up there. Um, good, strong, fine for behavioral activation. The same kind of survival curve I showed you, 
Uh, now, this sample is not as severe as the overall sample showed you before, but the same kind of thing. Continuation medication, you get better meds, better than taking medications away. Falls off very rapidly, you take the medications away from the folks you kept maintained on. Neither BA or CT show the same kind of enduring effect. Uh, only one study out right now, but I would say the behavioral activation has efficacious as medications as enduring as cognitive therapy. I want to see more replications of this kind of enduring effect before I convert, but um, again, I know very good cognitive therapists that have converted for Sephora Martel being one of them. Good stuff. Can you, can you briefly say what the difference is between behavioral activation and cognitive behavioral therapy? Yeah, uh, and Christopher can, can uh, elaborate on this if he would, uh, if you'd like to. But essentially, in behavioral activation, you're only focused on the behavior. You don't spend much time teaching people how to examine the accuracy of their own beliefs. You might do a little bit of that with them yourself, but not a whole lot. You've got to get them focused on doing stuff. You've got to get them focused on particularly going after avoidance behaviors, much like you would if somebody were uh, uh, had a phobia. Uh, and you're going to get them going, uh, doing the kind of things they would do if they weren't depressed, even though they're not depressed. And it's... Um, it's not quite meatball surgery. There's more skill involved, but it's an easier thing to teach people how to do than it is the additional cognitive stuff. Yes? Um, so in the main studies that you were, you were discussing, you use, it sounds like your primary outcome um, measure was the Hamilton rating yes. scale. Um, did you use, like, include any other measures? Uh, like, it, was it just looking at symptom reduction or also looking at, like, changes in life quality? Um, yeah. Um, Gee, the, uh, primarily the depression symptom measures, the ones we looked at, to the extent that people have looked at things like change in life quality, usually the better changes in life quality that go along with that, but they're relatively newer. Yeah, yeah, okay. I was just wondering, because sometimes, like, you know, there is also a disconnect between, like, symptom reduction and, like, yeah. yes. like real-world kind of yeah, improvements right. in functioning. We, we, don't, we don't tend to get that, but we haven't looked that often. Uh, and the one thing that we do have a pretty good sense of, at least for cognitive therapy, we don't know about BA yet, is that we do a better job of reducing distress than we do of upping positive affectivity. Right. And uh, we help people get less sad, but we don't necessarily help them get happier, more meaningful lives, necessarily. Go up India. I just want to say a word or two. Um, uh, um, Alpana's doing some marvelous work with immigrant populations coming from uh, Bhutan. Uh, I got involved the last couple of years with Kirkham Patel, who's doing some marvelous work in, where is Bella? There's Bella in South Asia, and uh, studying studied just out in the Lancet. Basically, they were working with non-professional lay counselors. These were essentially high school graduates, which for West India, but Southwest India is, is pretty well educated. These are mostly young women, and they were trained to do behavioral activation, a culturally adapted version of behavioral activation, the same kind of thing that Christopher would do, or the is going to try to do with the immigrant populations. Uh, and, this was compared to uh, treatment as usual in a general practice setting. What you can see is that, in hash usual care is what we call it, uh, over the three month acute treatment phase, we got significantly greater uh, change in the folks who were clinically depressed using these lay counselors, and it held up over the course of the year. Uh, we got a little spontaneous remission in the uh, control group, but we didn't lose the effect at all with these lay counselors. Uh, non professional folks. Uh, can be trained to do behavioral activation. They've only got about six to eight sessions to get in the range of the kind of things you're going to try to do. We've got some really, really nice results with that. Now, oh yeah, severity. I should mention that uh, the more severe somebody was, the greater the differential they got. Again, these are the people that uh, are going to do less well relative to the less severe patients, but they were the ones who showed the greater differential benefit from having got uh, uh, behavioral activation. Now, the study we want to do next, and we've got the grant in on that now. Uh, remember I told you earlier about Robert Rubis's PAI, and you can identify the best treatment. We want to start with the trial where we're going to randomize folks either to have that's the culturally adapted version of behavioral activation, which basically means you can't talk about sex and uh, uh, you involve the families. For whatever reason, that's a very crucial society. They have written the, uh, uh, it's the uh, textbook on sex with all the pictures. They've written that, but they don't practice. Well, they don't talk about practicing it anymore. You have to not talk about sex. You have to involve the families or the antidepressant medication. We're going to treat folks uh, until they get better. We're going to keep them off uh, treatments at that time, and then we're going to turn them to follow. And we're going to take a look at whether or not uh, HAP holds its own relative to medications in this population. We'll be curious what we find. But then halfway through, we're going to generate, use the first half of the sample to generate our treatment selection algorithms, the Rubus PAIs. And in the second half of the sample, we're going to use uh, randomize some folks to optimization according to the algorithm. We get a chance to compare people who get 
the treatment they're supposed to get given the algorithm versus folks at the team get assigned by the ongoing perspective tests whether or not we can improve the uh, overall efficiency of the treatment delivery system by getting the right treatment to a different person. And that's what we're looking for. And again, I think the parallels to what you're trying to do is just really quite striking. I stop at this point. And any other questions, thoughts you guys have?